Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this evening Bridges Lecture Series. My name is Doug Pierce. I'm the Dean of Arts here at the, at the uh, University of Waterloo, and I'm uh, delighted to be here. And I'm particularly pleased to see so many people braving both the weather and parking. Uh, and I hasten to add that even a dean can't control either of those two natural forces. Um, the Bridges series, uh, this was a unique series as far as I know. I, I don't know many of the universities have attempted this. It's been the fourth year of this series. It's a joint initiative of the Faculty of Mathematics, the Faculty of Arts, and St. Jerome's University. And the purpose of it, in many ways, is to almost go back to the future, to coin an overused cliche, and that is to try and find those threads that used to unite the various disciplines which understandably, but sometimes regrettably, have become overly specialized. Uh, I should add that my previous institution, until quite recently, maths was still an arts degree. Uh, they've changed that. Um, and it's very rare nowadays to find math and arts degree. And I can also tell you from talking with both my children and their friends who are many of an art students, math is a very alien concept to them. So tonight, and through the series, we are trying to find ways of bringing those two back in some kind of dialogue. Um, the nature of reality, the order of the universe, the purpose of life, these are all questions that can be approached from multiple disciplines. We certainly can't solve all those questions tonight, nor for that matter in this series, but through bridges, which I think is an extremely apt metaphor, we can start, if not at finding, the, finding the answers, certainly identifying the kind of questions that we can collaborate upon. Um, tonight's talk is a perfect example of that. It's on mathematics and democracy. I'm going to introduce our two speakers uh, right now, and I'll turn it over to them. I will be returning later to moderate the discussion. I would like to add at this point as well, this event is being recorded. So if you're not supposed to be here and you show up on it, it's not my fault, you've been forewarned. But more importantly, when it comes time to the question period, we would ask you to please use the two mics on the either side of the room, and that way we can capture your questions uh, for posterity. Our first speaker to this evening I'm delighted to introduce is Stephen Brams, professor of politics at New York University, and the author of an extremely impressive and wide-ranging series of works, totaling some 18 books and about 300 articles. Uh, having just done annual performance review, that's very impressive. <laughs> Most recent book is Game Theory in the Humanities, Bridging Two Worlds, published by MIT in 2011. Uh, his work is uh, signaled out by his application of game theory and social choice theory to voting in elections, bargaining and fairness, international relations, the Bible, theology, and literature. A rather modest scope of uh, interests. Former president of the Peace Science Society and the Public Choice Society, and fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, a Guggenheim Fellow, and a visiting scholar at the Russell Sage Foundation. Following Stephen's opening comments, Dr. Mark Kilgore, professor of mathematics at Wilfrid Laurie University, will be speaking. He's the research director of the conflict analysis for the Laurier Center for Military Strategic and Disarmament Studies and adjunct professors of systems design and engineering here at the University of Waterloo. He, too, has an impressive range of publications, including six books and nearly 400 articles in journals, conference proceedings, and edited books. His research interests lie at the intersection of mathematics, engineering, and social science. He has con contributed to arms control, environmental management, negotiation, arbitration, voting, fair division, coalition formation, and pioneered decision support systems for strategic conflict. He's president, uh, he was president of the Peace Science Society in 2012-13, and is currently president of INFORM section on group decision and negotiation. And again, I think you will all agree with me that the range of their interests uh, is Catholic in more ways than one, and speaks to that kind of ability to fuse together mathematics humanities, and the social sciences. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Stephen Brams up to, to uh, uh, start off tonight's session. And again, I'll be back to moderate the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. 
Well, I'm very pleased to be here, and I want to especially thank Benoit and Alicia for inviting the two of us. Uh, I agree that uh, bridging is an important task, and uh, bringing together the sciences and the humanities uh, in specific areas like tonight's uh, illustrates uh, the nexus between these uh, different areas. Um, <clears throat> let me say something about the title of our talk. Um, I think democracy really has two main features. One is free and fair elections, and I think nobody would disagree that that is uh, essential to democracy and the populace expressing itself through elections. And that's going to be our main topic tonight. But just as important to democracy is rule of law and due process, treating people fairly, treating people equally. And uh, we're not going to be talking about that topic tonight, but I did want to signal that that's an essential feature of democracy. In fact, um, I wrote a book a few years ago with that title, Mathematics and Democracy. And the subtitle was Designing <coughs> Procedures, <coughs> let me read it to you, Designing Better Voting and Fair Division Procedures. So I, develop, I um, devote seven chapters to voting in elections, and I devote seven chapters to fair division, uh, the second feature that I mentioned of democracy. Um, <coughs> and uh, what we're going to do tonight is that I'm going to, uh, after this introduction, turn things over to Mark, who's going to give, from a mathematician's point of view, an overview of different voting procedures and some of their properties. Um, that's the first 30 minutes or so. And then uh, he's going to turn the podium over to me, and I will be talking specifically about a voting procedure, which I think would ameliorate many of the problems that we have with elections today. I should emphasize that <clears throat> we're talking about elections in which there's a single winner. Uh, just as important is electing <clears throat> multiple winners in many kinds of elections, uh, trying to achieve, for example, proportional representation. But we won't have time to talk about it tonight, but maybe in the questions and answers, you might bring that topic up. Um, so I'm going to turn things over to Mark to give that overview of work on voting and elections in single winner elections. And then I'll make the case for this particular procedure, which we call approval voting. Um, I brought a copy of a book I wrote with Peter Fishburne on approval voting. And I'll pass that around along with Mathematics and Democracy. So if you get bored during our talks, you can take a look at the books. Okay, good. Uh, so, <clears throat> uh, am, I, am, I, am I mic'd up? Yes, I am. Good. Um, <clears throat> so, I'd like to, uh, uh, to thank, uh, I'm too mic'd up, I think. I would like uh, to thank uh, Benoit and Alicia for inviting Steve and me. I'd like to thank you for uh, the, the wonderful introduction and the nice, um, the, 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 uh, the warmth with which we've been received here tonight. And I'm pleased to see that so many people are interested in this topic because it's something that I think is important. Now, <clears throat> what I'm going to do is try and do the bridge from the math end. I'm going to try to show you how a mathematical study can tell you something about methods of, of voting, about methods of carrying out elections. So free and fair, free, fair and open elections are the cornerstone of democracy. We've all seen that. And I, I think we're accepting, we're taking that as an axiom here tonight. Mm. Um, an election is a process that aggregates input and <clears throat> is actually a group decision process. So you can think of it that way. And, and as a group decision process, uh, you try to appro produce appropriate and balanced outcomes. So this is a, a fairly common problem. And uh, you can study it in, in different, uh, different contexts, different ways, and it gives us a kind of standard by which we can judge uh, electoral systems. 
Now, a crucial idea, of course, is the ballot. And it's the vehicle that conveys the voters' input to the process. Uh, there are many different ballots, and I'll describe some of them in a few minutes. Uh, to count the ballots means to use the collection of ballots you've got to, to figure out the outcome of the election. And, of course, it turns out that there are some kinds of ballots that could be counted in many ways, and uh, people have tried to uh, figure out the best way to count the ballots, or at least ways to count the ballots that achieve certain properties. So uh, I'm, I'm going to try not to be very mathematical here, but if, if you have a mathematical bent, and I know there are some people in the audience, many people in the audience who do, you'll be able to see the mathematics underlying uh, what I've done. So well, we're uh, assuming that every voter has preferences for every candidate as unique winner of the election. And we usually assume strict preferences. That means no, nobody is indifferent among the candidates. That. <clears throat> and uh, I have here a list of uh, five forms of ballot which uh, might be used to conduct an election. There are others, but uh, this, this is enough for me to talk about. A plurality ballot simply lists the candidates and says, which is the candidate you most prefer? That's what we usually use when we have elections in Canada. Uh, another kind of ballot, and this is the one that uh, Steve will be um, encouraging our, the use of in, in, uh, when, when he takes over in a few minutes, is the approval ballot. And the approval ballot says, indicate all of the candidates of whom you approve. Mm. Next kind of ballot is a rank, and it actually would actually rank all of the candidates in order of your preference. Um, the next one is a graded ballot, where you grade all of the candidates using some kind of scale. I suggested A, B, C, D, F, but there are lots of other scales possible. Uh, <clears throat> finally, there's a range ballot, which simply says score all the candidates. Zero is the worst you can imagine, 100 is the best you can imagine. Where do these candidates fit in on this thermometer? So <clears throat> I'm going to describe some forms of election which depend on these ballots. So plurality, well, the most common system, the one we're all familiar with, uh, among theorists it is widely regarded as perhaps the, as, as probably the worst possible voting system. Now, this is not to say that everybody has a good idea of what it could be replaced with, but that's another problem. So what, has it got to, what, to, what can you say about it that's good? Well, it's, uh, it's quite simple. There's only one ballot that is consistent with a typical person's preferences, and there's only one way to count the ballots, and that's easy. So that's, that's good. It's very sensitive to preferences, so if you tweak everybody's preference a little, then you'll probably change a lot of ballots. Mm. Uh, approval is a little more complicated. It was proposed around the same time by, by Steve and Peter Fishburne and by a bunch of other people, kind of all, all more or less at the same time, uh, but relatively recent, 1978. It is not simple in the sense that many ballots might be consistent with the same set of preferences, but there is only one way to count them, and it's easy. Now notice the voters must make a decision as to which candidates they approve of. How, how high does somebody have to be on your thermometer for you to approve them? Uh, one of the advantages is that it's not so sensitive to preferences. If you tweak everybody's preferences, you probably won't change the ballots very much. Uh, continuing. Uh, ranked elections, that is where the ballot asks you to rank all the candidates. There are, in fact, many procedures for counting the ballots. Uh, it's, these are simple. There's only one ballot that's consistent with preferences. But there, there is just a great range, and I'll describe some of them later, of uh, ways to count ballots. Some are easy, some are not. 
different counting methods display different sensitivities to preferences. Uh, next one, uh, this is proposed 2006 by uh, Belinsky and Larrakey. The, they, these are graded ballots and they suggest that the grade scale should be chosen to be familiar to voters. And in fact, knowing uh, what's familiar to typical Canadians, I think A, B, C, D, F would, be, would, would convey, convey this idea. So the idea is that the scale should have some meaning. Uh, it's not just an abstract thing. Uh, <clears throat> it's relatively, uh, uh, the, the Belinsky and Larrakey proposed a so-called majority judgment procedure uh, to count the ballots. Uh, it's complex, but at least it's computationally not difficult. It's also relatively insensitive to preferences, and uh, the reason is it essentially relies on medians rather than uh, other measures to deal with. So medians are relatively insensitive to the input numbers. Uh, finally, range elections proposed very recently, 2004. Um, we're a bit controversial, but the claim is that uh, it, they, dis, they discourage voters from being strategic. So you, you actually score every candidate. And uh, counting ballots is at least easy. But, uh, and, and uh, there, there's a question as to how sensitive it is to preferences. It really does, it is sensitive to outliers because it's relying on a mean to score. Now, we'll skip this notation stuff and uh, I'm actually going to conduct uh, a comparison of some voting procedures. Now, I'm just doing this to give you an idea of the kind of thing that can be done. So I've chosen my voting procedures and my comparison to, to give myself an easy task. But you'll be able to see the kinds of questions that can be asked, asked the kinds of answers that come up. So we're going to compare plurality with several procedures that use a ranked ballot. And uh, the reason that's got not too much work on my part is that the ranked ballot doesn't require any strategy selection by the, by the voter. You've got your preferences, you just write them down. So I'm assuming each voter has a strict preference ordering over the candidates, and we want to have one candidate who is the winner, though we may have to put up with ties. So here's an example. This is um, uh, a case where you have five voters and three candidates. And in this, in this so-called preference profile, you can read that, can, that voter one likes C better than B, better than A, and so on. So if that's the uh, election, and if, if all of these voters do exactly what they're supposed to do, what will happen? Well, let's go back and look at it. If, if in a plurality election you're asked, who is your favorite candidate? So you can see you've got two C's, two B's, and one A. So in a plurality election, B, C, we got a tie. Okay, now the next way to count is called board account. In the board account, you assign zero points to the lowest ranked candidate one to the next ranked candidate, two to the next one after that, and so on. And if you go back and do that, you can see that candidate uh, A is going to get two zeros, two ones, and a two. That's four. Candidate B is going to get a zero, two, two ones, and two twos. That's six. Candidate C is going to get uh, uh, five. And so here's the board of scores you end up with right here, and the board of winner is B. So now again, the, you can, since we have a ranked system, people are reporting their rankings, and I'm assuming, of course, that everyone is being truthful. Now, <clears throat> next, next system is called, uh, I call it the hair system. Uh, after someone named, I think, Kenneth Hare, who invented it mid-Victorian. Mid um, it's also called single transferable vote and is 
used in a number of countries, uh, Australia, Ireland, Malta, some other places. Uh, it has recently become popular in the US where it's called instant runoff, <laughs> IRV, instant runoff voting. And <clears throat> the rules are a little bit complicated. You can see why this wasn't, that this came up in the computer age. The rule is any alternative that is at the top of at least half the rankings is at least tied for winner. The procedure then terminates. Otherwise, you delete the alternative or alternatives that appear at the top of the fewest uh, lists, fewest rankings, and then repeat. Every deletion step eliminates something, so the procedure, the system keeps getting smaller and smaller, and um, you get a winner eventually. And if you go back here, you can see that A appears at the top of the fewest lists. So we therefore eliminate A from all of the lists. And what we end up with is this little bit here. These are the same lists with A missing. And you can see that B is now at the top of more than half of the lists. So B has won uh, on the hair system. Uh, another system, uh, I actually like this one because if you have only two candidates, it's, it's, there's a good rules for deciding between them, and this is maybe a way to, to bro break up the problem into a whole bunch of twos, pairs. So what you have, <clears throat> you need an agenda. And the agenda is a listing of the candidates. What you do is take the first two candidates and pair them against each other, see who gets the most support. Then you take the winner against the third candidate on the list, and so on, you keep going down. So <clears throat> for, this, uh, for this example, I took the agenda A, B, C, which means first A against B, and then the winner against C. And you can see what happens in this case is that uh, uh, B beats A three to two. So we discard, do we discard A, B is left, B beats C three to two. So the, the winner is B. And just to look at this so you can see that if it's B against A, then more than half the lists, this one, this one, and this one, B is better than A. And so that's why B beats A. And then, then you have B against C. And again, you can see that B beats C in more than half the lists. Uh, <clears throat> My final rule, I just put this in as a, um, <clears throat> as a kind of marker. Why not appoint somebody as dictator and let the dictator's choice prevail? <laughs> well, actually, this does have a few good things to say about it, but it uh, uh, does not very appealing. <laughs> so let's leave it in. Let's leave it in for the moment. Uh, <laughs> if if, we, if, vo if uh, voter four is the dictator, the, the winner is A. Now this is a little more complicated example and I'm not gonna work through it here, but there are seven voters and five candidates. And uh, if for the sequential, you use the agenda A, B, C, D, E, and if you declare the dictator is number seven, voter seven, then in fact, all five procedures give a different outcome. So that demonstrates that it really does matter how you count the votes. Now, one of the things that you can do, uh, speaking mathematically, is you can formulate conditions that you would like a voting system to satisfy. Desirable properties. And one of them, here's the Pareto condition. Uh, the Pareto condition is if every voter ranks X ahead of Y, then Y can't win. Now X might win or it might not, but Y cannot win. Okay, that's, that's the Pareto condition. Now I'd like to come up now with a definition, this is a definition thrown in here. Uh, a candidate is called a Condorcet winner if that candidate defeats every other candidate pairwise. 
So for any other candidate Y, more than half the voters rank X ahead of Y. Now, if you have a profile of votes, if you have a set of lists, there might or might not be a Condorcet winner. Uh, Condorcet was a, a, a one of the early voting theorists of the uh, 18th century. He was, he was French, and he did not survive the revolution. Um, but he did have some very good ideas. And one of them was formulating this idea of a Condorcet winner. If there is a Condorcet winner, then that Condorcet winner defeats every other candidate pairwise. So who else would you rather have win the election? So the Condorcet condition, if a candidate is a Condorcet winner, then it's a unique winner. That candidate is the unique winner of the election. Uh, this is one that I think is important, monotonicity. Monotonic means always going up or down, but up. So in this says, if candidate X is a winner, and if one voter moves X up in that voter's ordering, then X should still be a winner. In other words, if it's monotonic, then you can't, can't do any harm to vote for people you like. You vote, you, you, the, the more support you give them, the more likely they are to win. And finally, independence of irrelevant alternatives. This really is, well, OK, I'll tell you what it says. It says, if x is a winner and y is not a winner, and you construct a new preference profile for every voter in which the voters leave x and y in the same, rel each voter leaves x and y in the same relative position as before, but just changes other things, then if you do that, every voter's x and y are in the same relative position, then um, y cannot be a winner. So really, it says, if x is a winner and y is not, then uh, the relative positions of x and y make uh, mean that y can never be a winner. Now, you can ask, for any profile of preferences, would these conditions be satisfied? And the question is sometimes yes. The answer is sometimes yes and sometimes no. Now, when there's a yes here, that means, well, if there's a dictator, the dictator always satisfies the Pareto condition. All right, that's true. Um, Pareto condition is if every voter likes x better than y, then y cannot win. Well, a dictator x, x better than y, and uh, <clears throat> so y could, certainly can't win. So you see, the Condorcet condition is pretty hard to get to work. Uh, <clears throat> monotonicity is uh, satisfied by most of these rules, but not the hair system. And independence of irrelevant alternatives uh, doesn't do all that well either. Now, again, um, if there's a yes there, there's a theorem that says for any profile, if you use this, this system to count the, count the ballots, then you'll find this property holds. If there's a no there, it says there is some, some profile of ballots such that if you count them in this way, this property will fail. And I have a couple of examples. I don't want to spend very much time on them, but this is a, this is a very simple one. It shows that Borda count fails Condorcet. So here we have three voters who like A better than B better than C and two voters who like B better than C better than A. And you can see that A is the Condorcet winner. A defeats both B and C, three to two. On the other hand, if you count the scores, A gets three twos and two zeros. B gets three ones and two twos. And C only gets one. I think C, I think C actually gets two, but anyway. But, uh, <clears throat> we can't have slides that are completely without typos. <laughs> so you can, uh, so this, this is an example which shows that the very nice um, Borda system of giving point counts 
could fail to elect a Condorcet winner. All right, I'm just gonna, um, I, I'm gonna flip through, these are pretty long. The slide is a little ugly. It says the hair system fails the Condorcet condition. Uh, sequential pairwise fails the Pareto condition. And the hair system fails monotonicity. This is, uh, this is my set. I think Steve also has a, a slide that illustrates the same point. So again, what, it's, what it says is if you're using this instant runoff system, then it might be possible for someone to say, well, I voted for this guy, but if I hadn't voted for him, he would have won. <laughs> and I think it's a very bad to have a system that it encourages people to doubt what they did. So let me uh, go on to a story here. This is, uh, I was at a workshop in Chateau du Beffy, which is in Normandy, 2010. It was a meeting of voting theorists. And they got talking. <laughs> the story was, what is the best voting rule that the city council of your town should use to elect the mayor? <laughs> now this, this was the question that people decided to vote. And the idea was, we would propose voting methods, and then we would vote on them. <laughs> so we, we proposed 17 voting procedures that were nominated by the participants. Uh, there, there were quite a range of them. Most of them had ranked ballots. Well, most of, a lot of them had ranked ballots, but plurality was there, plurality with runoff, approval, uh, majority judgment, range voting, they were all listed. And the 22 voters, decided to vote using approval voting. I can't really give you an explanation of that, but the results are very interesting because approval got the most votes. <laughs> and you can see some of the others there. Um, most of these, I can tell you what they were. I have to, some of them I would have to look up. Uh, I would, would point out that plurality got zero. Like I said, it's universally regarded as perhaps the worst possible system. So, dozens of desirable properties for voting systems have been proposed. Um, I have compared only ranked ballots. Uh, other procedures using different kinds of ballots, do they do better? Well, and the answer is some yes, some no. There's no perfect procedure that satisfies all properties and uh, the jury is still out on some of the, some of the questions. Um, theorists tend to feel that the, the best choice of voting system may depend on what kind of election you're going to have, who the winner is supposed to be, who the, uh, how the voter should be represented, the voter's opinion should be represented, and so on. There may be trade-offs across procedures, so the best procedure may be a matter of saying, well, I like this and this property, so I'm willing to give up that one. Another issue that I haven't mentioned very much is strategy. If the ballot is accompanied by an instruction to the voter, if you think the voter is say, the ballot is saying, name your favorite candidate, or rank your candidates in order, could you possibly be motivated to be untruthful in your response? Uh, many people in elections in Canada have wondered this question, wondered about this question recently. And um, it, would it ever be to your advantage not to, not to be truthful? Um, that's, uh, plurality is particularly vulnerable to strategic voting. Um, and many people think this strategic voting is a terrible thing, though I, I wonder, is it, is it all, is it that bad? Maybe you should think about the election as being a procedure for doing something, and just your input is part of the is part of the part of the procedure. Uh, there are a bunch of issues that I have not mentioned. Uh, the complexity: how hard is it for a voter to decide how to vote? If you're told to do something, how much effort is it to figure out what you really think to put on the ballot? Even if you're trying to be truthful, how hard is it to count the ballots? How vulnerable is counting to errors? Uh, how vulnerable is the electoral system to manipulation or voter fraud? 
Um, is it transparent? Can everybody see afterwards how the result was determined? And finally, uh, is it an easy system to implement? Uh, I think that's the end of my presentation. I uh, have to admit I took some of the, some of the examples for this from uh, a book by Alan Taylor and Alison Pacelli. And uh, I would like to recommend this as being a sort of relatively low level mathematics book that um, has uh, quite a bit of interesting content, including a good, good comparison of elections. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Well, I think Mark gave an excellent overview of the variety of procedures. And uh, it's really going to be my job to single out one uh, and make arguments why I think we should adopt this system. It just happens to be the system that won in this election uh, that he mentioned at the end. Uh, but I came to my position many years before that. Uh, so I wasn't influenced by that particular election. So what I'm going to do is, uh, without any examples at the moment, uh, talk about some of the advantages of approval voting. Now, uh, let me define approval voting again so that we're clear on uh, what it allows and what it doesn't allow. Um, approval voting is a voting system in which you can approve of as many candidates or alternatives as you like. Uh, the candidate where the most approval wins. So again, we're talking about single winner elections, such as for president, mayor, governor. Uh, there are multiple candidates, so we assume that there are more than two candidates in general. But it will work for two candidates. It's just that if there are only two candidates, one would presumably approve of one and not approve of the other. But that's exactly what you can do with plurality voting. So it's really not needed for two candidate elections. But we think it is needed for multi-candidate elections with three or more candidates. Uh, so let me give you an example. Let's say there are five candidates. Um, then you can do everything you can under the present system, which gets to uh, the first advantage. It gives you more flexible options. Uh, you can do everything you can under the present system, but you can do more. So under the present system, plurality voting I'm talking about, um, you can uh, approve of one candidate. But let's say uh, you're indifferent between two candidates. Two candidates uh, are uh, at the top of your list, and you really can't distinguish well between them. Or one might be slightly worse than the other, but they're both acceptable. Then you can vote for two. You can also vote for three or four. And I think you might vote for, all, for four candidates if you despise the, third, the um, fifth candidate. So if you want to express yourself um, <clears throat> and you despise one candidate, you vote for everybody else. So it gives you opportunity to express yourself in many more ways than you can under plurality voting, where you have to make a single choice. And Mark made the argument that it's more complex than plurality voting. I have a slight disagreement. I think it's probably more simple, because if you're indifferent between two or three candidates are all acceptable. Um, it's easier to indicate that than to arbitrarily choose one of those two or three. So I think in that sense, uh, it's simpler than plurality voting, where you're forced to make a choice, perhaps arbitrary, of just one candidate. So it gives you these more flexible options. The second advantage, that's from an individual's point of view. The second advantage is it helps select the strongest candidate overall, who's generally going to be the centrist, the candidate in the middle, acceptable to people on both the left and the right. Let me give you an example of an election that I experienced uh, after I came to New York. Uh, in 1970, there was a three-way race for US Senate in New York. And there were three candidates. There was a strong left candidate, a strong right candidate, and a candidate in the middle. The candidate in the middle was actually the incumbent governor who had been appointed uh, because the governor uh, became a candidate for vice president. It was Nelson Rockefeller. So the lieutenant governor became the governor, 
And this was the first election in which he ran in his own right. <laughs> so the results in the end were the candidate on the left got 37% of the vote. The candidate on the right got 39%. The candidate in the middle, the incumbent governor, got 24%. So he came in third. But I would argue that he was probably the strongest candidate overall, the Condorcet winner, as Mark explained. If he had been in a pairwise race against the left candidate, he would have gotten support from the right and beaten the left candidate. And similarly, if it had been a pairwise contest with the right candidate, he would have gotten support from the left, plus his own centrist support, and beaten the, the candidate on the right. But he came in third. Now, the usual so, uh, solution to that kind of problem is to have a runoff between the top two. But a runoff wouldn't have solved the problem, because a runoff would have been between the left and right. So you lose the third candidate, the strongest candidate, even though he came in third in the race, the Condorcet winner. So that's an example uh, <coughs> of uh, our present election system, plurality voting, electing the strongest minority candidate, but ignoring the majority candidate, the Condorcet winner, the candidate in the middle. So my argument is it would help to elect the strongest candidate overall, not the strongest minority candidate. The third advantage I give is uh, that it gives minority candidates their proper due. Uh, typically, minority candidates suffer from what political scientists call the wasted vote phenomenon. phenomenon. If you think a candidate cannot win, uh, you abandon him often and vote for a candidate you can, who can win because you can help that candidate. He might not be your favorite. Uh, and that's an example of insincere or strategic voting. Um, <clears throat> well, if we have approval voting and your favorite candidate is a fringe candidate, on the left or right, let's say, you don't have to abandon him or her. You can continue to vote for him or her it's just that you should also take into account that there's a candidate who actually can win, and uh, shouldn't you also approve of that candidate, the preferred of the centrist candidates, let's say. So um, therefore, the minority candidate doesn't lose from the wasted vote phenomenon, because people have an incentive still to vote for their favorite, even if he's a certain loser. Uh, so I'll give you some statistics. And, um, 1968, there was a minority candidate, a right-wing candidate in the US presidential election named George Wallace. Um, and George Wallace uh, appealed to the common person, the common voter. And um, in the polls in the spring of 1988, he was showing 21%, which was almost competitive with roughly 30%. Uh, 35% that the other two candidates, the major party candidates, were getting. Um, but in the actual election in November, he came in <coughs> with only 14%. So actually, uh, he lost a third of his support, 7%, because people abandoned him knowing that only one of the major party candidates, a Republican or Democrat, would win. But if there had been approval voting, then people could still vote for Wallace, that third party candidate, uh, and also vote for the Republican or Democrat, whichever they preferred. So in a sense, approval voting um, allows you to, do, to vote sincerely, but at the same time to vote strategically, to have your cake and eat it too. Uh, so minority candidates would get their proper due. They wouldn't suffer from the wasted vote phenomenon. The fourth argument, um, that I give for approval voting is that it will reduce negative campaigning. I'm not uh, so familiar with Canadian elections, but in American elections, running negative campaigns is almost necessary to win, uh, to find the dirt on your opponent and emphasize that, and that's why voters should vote for you. Um, <clears throat> but in order to win under approval voting, uh, if you trash the opposition, especially if the opposition is ideologically close to you, you may be losing votes because that opposition candidate close to you would also 
his supporters would also vote for you. So trashing the opposition is not very wise if you're cutting off support from those voters who, could, who would also approve of you. So I think approval voting would force you to broaden your appeal, be less negative, try to bring in more support. And that's going to be most effective when done by centrist candidates who are credible as candidates in the middle. Um, and therefore, there would be less negative campaigning because it wouldn't work. You'd actually reduce your vote total by being too negative rather than being positive and trying to draw in support, uh, especially from the sides if you're a centrist candidate. The fifth advantage is that I think it would increase voter turnout for the simple reason that voters can better express themselves under approval voting. Uh, so they're more likely to go to the polls in the first place. Uh, the recent high in participation in American presidential elections was 1960, uh, John Kennedy versus Richard Nixon. Uh, the percentage of the voting age population that actually went to the polls was 63%. Now it's uh, plateaued over the last few elections at about 50%. So um, bringing 13% more voters into the system would bring tens of millions of voters in the United States into the system who now feel alienated because they cannot express themselves properly. They may like a third party candidate. Uh, he may even be viable, but they don't think he can win, so they don't go to the polls. And related to that, I think it would induce new candidates, especially centrist, to win, to run, sorry. Uh, because many candidates whom you would consider desirable, now particularly in the Republican Party, moderate Republicans, uh, no, they don't have a chance against uh, more conservative opponents. Uh, but under approval voting, it's the centrists who benefit. So they would be more likely to run in the first place. Um, an example would be in uh, <clears throat> the last election, or actually going back to 2008, um, the mayor of New York, uh, Michael Bloomberg. He actually considered a run for president uh, and <clears throat> decided that he would probably be taking away votes from Obama that year. Uh, and probably couldn't win anyway because although he had won as an independent in New York City, the mayorship, um, he probably would have lost in the national election, so he didn't run. But I think because he was relatively liberal on social issues and conservative on economic issues, he had broad appeal. And if he had run under approval voting, I think he might have had a fighting chance of actually winning because especially he was rich and could have spent as much as the Republican and Democratic candidates, um, and would have been a, therefore a viable contender for president in, 19, in 2008. And the final point I want to make is that approval voting is eminently practicable. It can be implemented on existing voting machines, uh, so you don't have to go to a ranking system and uh, <coughs> computer aggregation of preferences, uh, you simply have to adjust the machines so that they register votes for more than one candidate by voters. And to change <coughs> the law does not take a constitutional amendment. In the United States, to get rid of the Electoral College, which I consider probably <coughs> one of the worst institutions in the United States, because it sometimes elects um, candidates who don't win the popular vote, that happened in 2000. Uh, in uh, 2000, <coughs> the, uh, I'm blanking on names now, uh, Gore and uh, Bush, uh, Bush won the electoral vote by three votes out of uh, 400, 535, um, but he lost the popular vote uh, by about half a million votes to Al Gore. Uh, <coughs> So uh, to change the law, one would simply have to get states uh, to enact a statute, not a constitutional amendment, to change the voting systems to allow people to uh, cast more than one vote. 
and we've actually rewritten the laws in some states. Uh, and um, therefore, it would be easier to change than changing the Electoral College, because that's written into the Constitution. Um, OK, you might say, oh, it's got all these advantages. Uh, what are the disadvantages? Well, there aren't none, of course. <laughs> but some people allege <laughs> that it would <clears throat> elect the lowest common denominator, the bland, inoffensive candidate who tries to be everything to everybody, the centrist in the middle. My argument is that if you try to be everything to everybody, you won't even be minimally acceptable to most voters. Uh, and a good example of that would be Ronald Reagan. Nobody ever accused Ronald Reagan of being bland or pusillanimous, but uh, polls indicate that he would have won not only on the approval voting, but virtually every voting system in both 1980 and 1984, the two elections he won. So I don't think you could get away with being this inoffensive candidate whom everybody would approve of uh, by being that kind of candidate. The second argument against approval voting it was, is that it would undermine the two-party system in the United States. Well, in my opinion, there's nothing sacrosanct, sacrosanct about the two-party system. Other countries, including Canada, have lived quite well with more than two parties. And um, in fact, most democracies in the world have multi-party systems. Uh, five or six major parties is typical. And then they form coalition government. But that's a very different story. Uh, these are not single winner elections. But my main point is that I think it would be better if the system opened up the third, fourth party candidates and approval voting would help it open up because they could win. And they can't win today. So those are my uh, main arguments for approval voting and at least a brief discussion of its possible disadvantages. So now let me go to my next slide and say something about, um, first of all, its technical features, and second of all, uh, adoptions. Um, so Peter Fishburne in our book, which I passed around, made a number of arguments uh, <coughs> using uh, mathematical analysis. One is that it's more sincere and strategy proof than other non-ranked systems. I mean by that plurality voting or plurality voting with a runoff. Uh, that is, voters have more incentive to express themselves truthfully, honestly, which Mark was talking about. And strategy proofness means it's uh, not manipulable. So it's more difficult to manipulate. Um, and I could go into reasons why, but let me leave it at that. The second uh, technical feature is it allows voters to express intensities and be more efficacious. Uh, there are technical definitions underlying it, but, but the basic idea is that whether you like just one candidate or you like all but one, you can better express yourself and thereby be more efficacious in helping that candidate or those candidates to win. And finally, it compares favorably with rank systems that Mark mostly talked about, like the board account and the hair system of single transferable vote uh, in electing the Condorcet winners, the candidates who can beat everybody else. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about those other systems uh, to make the comparison more clear cut. So what about adoptions? Well, <clears throat> soon after we and others had the idea, uh, I tried to convince politicians that this was the system that should be adopted. And um, I began in New Hampshire, where I'm from originally, uh, <clears throat> and testified before House and Senate committees, spoke to the governor, was on the local public television station, did everything I could, native son returns to tell the state what it should be doing. Didn't go over very well. <laughs> and in other states, uh, not so well either, where I testified. But out of the blue, I got a phone call one day from a state senator uh, from North Dakota uh, who happened to be a math teacher, high school math teacher. And he said, you know, we just passed a bill in North Dakota to enact um, approval voting in statewide elections. And I said, that's great. 
um, if you want me to come, I'd be glad to um, talk to people, testify. And he said, well, it probably wouldn't be helpful if you as a carpetbagger from New York came to North Dakota. <laughs> Uh, so I didn't go, and it didn't pass uh, in the House, um, North Dakota. The closest we've come in public elections is Oregon in 1980. The state legislature mandated election in which there were five propositions on the ball ballot about supporting education uh, to raise uh, sales tax by two different levels income tax by two different levels, and then a general proposition to revise the system. And it was approval voting which was used, so you could vote for as many of these propositions as you liked. And you can guess what one under approval voting revised the system without saying how. So nothing much happened with that use. It was a special election, so it wasn't for candidates. It was for these different alternatives. We've been more successful in private elections uh, so I've talked to the boards of a number of societies, uh, and I'm proud to say in this audience, for the mathematicians especially, that the two major math societies in the United States, Mathematical Association of America, which is more oriented toward um, teaching, and the American Mathematical Society more oriented research, uh, both with over 30,000 members, have adopted approval voting in the election of their presidents and others. And I'm also um, pleased to say that, <clears throat> uh, that the first woman mathematician ever elected president of the MAA was under approval voting in its first use. Um, also, uh, another math-oriented organization, INFORMS, which Mark alluded to, and several others, about a dozen others, now use approval voting. Uh, it's used in numerous colleges and universities. We elect the chair in my department at NYU using approval voting. Often you find that the <coughs> candidate who would be most acceptable is the first one to turn the dean down. But uh, our procedure is every tenured faculty member is eligible to be chair, and we use approval voting, no nominations. And that person is usually chosen, the one acceptable to the most people. And then a dean cuts a deal with him. Remember this. And uh, usually it works out that you would get the most qualified person uh, to be the chair of your department. Um, it's also used, been, been used by search committees to elect presidents of universities. Uh, the most well-known uses are in the election of popes since the 13th century. Now, things are uh, not so clear in some of these elections, these are secret elections, but everything we know about these elections indicates that effectively approval voting is being used. Uh, the cardinals can vote for as many candidates as they like. And sometimes it's been a two-thirds decision rule, sometimes it's been simple majority. And it's also been used more informally to elect secretary generals uh, in the United Nations since World War II. It wasn't called approval voting, that was before the name was used and it was analyzed, but it was approval voting. Okay, uh, let me give you arguments of why I think systems that I used in uh, more elections have major problems. Here's an example that illustrates its use. Uh, it's a successive elimination procedure whereby the low candidates are dropped and the votes of their supporters are transferred to second, third, and lower choices. So in this particular example, I assume that there are four classes of voters. Voters here rank the candidates A, preferred to B, preferred to C, preferred to D, six in class two, five in class three, and three in class four. Uh, 21 voters in all, a simple majority is needed to elect the candidate. That drops down if you're electing more than one winner. I won't discuss those details, but uh, let's look at an example. So you start out counting only first choices. So <clears throat> A gets seven, B gets six, C gets five, and D gets three. Look at only the numbers to the left of the slash. Who's the low person? D. So his votes are now transferred. He, he's eliminated. His votes are transferred to C. So C now has... <clears throat> 
3 plus 5 and goes up to 8. D is eliminated. A and B continue to get 7 and 6. Nobody's gotten the majority yet. So the next low person is now eliminated. That's B. His choices go to his second uh, best candidate. That's A. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, A wins with 6 plus 7 is 13. That's more than the simple majority of 11. And that's the result under this system. Now what I want to show is a little problem. Let's say these class four voters move A from last place to first place. There's a change of heart. You discover something about A. He's now the greatest. You put him in first place. So now I want to look at the numbers to the right of the slash. Nobody votes for D. A now gets 3 plus 7 is 10. B continues to get 6. C gets 5. Who's the low person? It's C. C's votes go to B. And now B gets 5 plus 6 is 11 and wins. So for the original preferences of the class 4 voters, A won. When A is moved into first place by these voters, he loses. So that's non-monotonicity. You raise somebody in your preferences and you actually cause them to lose. And if there's anything antithetical to democracy is that the more votes should hurt. Or more support, raising somebody in your preferences should hurt. And that's what non-monotonicity does. This was not realized for basically 100 years since it was invented in the 1850s by Thomas Hare, and simultaneously uh, a Dane named Carl George Andre drained it up, but because we're an Anglo-Saxon country, it became the Hare system. So that I consider a fatal flaw with this system. Um, <clears throat> and uh, we pointed it out to supporters of what's called instant runoff or <clears throat> ranked choice voting, they've changed the name. Um, and I think we've made pro some progress in convincing people that that's a fatal flaw with a system. So now let me go to the second major system that um, competes with approval voting, and that's the board account. It's used in several private organizations. As Mark explained, it's a scoring system in which if there are N candidates, the candidate one ranks first, gets N minus one votes, down to the candidate who won the ranks class gets zero votes. Uh, it's very vulnerable to manipulation, and let me give you a real life example. Let's say you like the three candidates in the 1992 US presidential election as Clinton's your first choice, Bush the father is your second, Perot a significant third party candidate in that election is your third choice. So you would give Clinton two points, uh, <clears throat> Bush one point and Perot zero points. About 15% of the voters had those preferences in that election. Um, the problem with being sincere is you would uh, be helping Bush, the main competitor, because the polls a weekend before said it was a neck and neck race uh, in 1992. It didn't turn out that way, but that was what the polls were saying. So it would be stupid to give one point to your second choice. So you'd have an incentive to switch your ranking to still keep Clinton in first choice, now move Perot up to second choice, put Bush, the main competitor, in third place, and that maximizes the distance between your favorite, Clinton, and his closest competitor, Bush. And now I say in parentheses, if most Clinton and Bush supporters acted this way, Perot might conceivably win. But I don't think so. Okay, so I'm getting to the end, and now let me show you another problem with the board account. Okay, in this particular case, we have three, two, and two voters who have different preferences, and it turns out the board account puts C in first place, B in second place, A in third place. Now let's say we introduce this irrelevant candidate X. So X is in nobody's First choice, no, it's nobody's first choice. Uh, at best, is second. 
and in two rankings is third. Now we get the following point totals, and notice that instead of CBA, it's ABC. We completely reverse the preference order. This candidate can't win, but he causes <coughs> somebody else to win and a reversal of the preference order. So that example illustrates manipulability by changing the agenda. The introduction of X, who cannot win, and consequently would appear irrelevant, completely reverses the point total order. Uh, <clears throat> so the question is, should C or A win dependent upon X? Certainly, A has an incentive to say to X, let's say I say to Mark, you want to be running with the three of us? Join your candidate X. Now, I, instead of coming in first place, th third place, A, come in first place because you entered even though you didn't win. So that's another kind of manipulability, which I think uh, is a real problem with the board account. Approval voting much less manipulable in that regard. And my final slide uh, is designed to show something else. And now the question I ask is, can approval voting be improved by allowing more voters voters more than two grades. So you might say, okay, you've convinced me approval voting is great, but really what if I have preferences such that <clears throat> I want to give points and indicate that, okay, I have a best candidate and a worst candidate, but I want to say that there's some candidates in the middle who deserve middling levels of points. So let's say there are three candidates and I uh, want to give two to the best one to the next best, and zero to the worst. Okay, let's say these voters are sincere. We have two A, B voters, so they, get, they say A and B are the best. They give two points. We have two B and C voters. They say B and C are the best. And we have two A, C voters. And notice the A, C voters consider their middling candidates just worth one point. What I want to do is show something to what, similar to what Mark showed. A has the greatest total score, if you add the points up. B has the greatest median score, that's related to the blinsky larrakey argument for choosing the median winner. And C is graded higher by more voters than A, that's related to the Condorcet criterion. In effect, C is a Condorcet criterion. So let's say that we now <coughs> Telescope the votes into just two grades, one and zero, rather than two, one, and zero. If we do so in a natural way, notice that two of the three voters in each case uh, <clears throat> rank one candidate or two candidates highest and then the others lowest. The two, two, zero would be one, one, zero. The one, two, two would be zero, one, one. And the one, zero, one would continue, one, zero, one. The totals turn out to be 657, ABC, C is a winner under approval voting. What's interesting beyond this example is we have a theorem. Approval voting ensures that there's no discrepancy between the greatest total score winner, when you add up points, and the candidate graded higher by more voters, basically the Condorcet criterion. It's the only scoring system where you give grades to candidates in which that occurs. So it has this kind of appeal beyond just that you grade candidates. Grading, giving people only two grades is better than giving them more grades because you don't have different winners depending on the number of grades. So I'm going to stop there. I think we're running out of time and we'll entertain questions. Thank you. As I indicated before, we do have two microphones set up. So if you do have questions, please use the microphone so we capture it for the record. Um, I've asked uh, both speakers that have joined me up here, so uh, um, have at her. Hi. Um, in many voting systems, it's not required to um, cast a ballot or to cast a vote for every candidate in the election. So um, does approval voting 
alter significantly if uh, you're not required to, um, to cast a, or do any of the voting systems? The board account is what I'm thinking of specific. Does it alter significantly if not every um, candidate is ranked on the ballot? Do you want to say something first? Uh, I, think, I think that it does. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, if you're asked to rank the candidates and you say, well, you know, one, two, three, and I don't care about the rest, uh, I think that can have an effect on the outcome. Well, not only it can, because if you, the usual assumption in that situation is the ones ranked, not ranked, get zero. So in effect, you're saying they're the worst. You're saying, I, I'm indifferent between or among all these other, other but, candidates. What I'm specifically um, questioning is, is the properties that you illustrated yeah. uh, of the different voting systems, yeah. does allowing an omission on the ballot um, alter the Condorcet uh, uh, accounts, for yes, example? Yes, I, I think it can. Uh, but um, it probably doesn't, it, you'll probably have to work hard to find examples, but uh, yes. So my question is heretical to mathematicians. Um, so all of these voting systems have some issues. And if you look at the examples that you're coming up to show that certain properties are not met, they're kind of tortured properties with small numbers. And in general, we have elections with lots of people who do large numbers of things. And if you're depending upon um, everybody acting in a certain way to violate this property, then that in the real world just doesn't happen because actually coordinating voters is a terrible thing. Otherwise, strategic voting under you know, plurality voting would actually accomplish something, which it rarely does. So my question is, is there work that's been done to actually evaluate under more realistic large-scale conditions what voting systems are more resilient in the sense that these bad problems that come up with violating these conditions actually occur in practice as opposed to just can theoretically con occur? Because uh, that's what I really care about, not so much whether it's possible to come up with right. tortured counterexamples. Uh, as, as I said near the end, uh, I think most theorists are of the view that there is no best, obviously best system, so you have to decide what your trade-offs are. You have to decide, you know, look at the frequency of, a, of violations of some property and say, well, that's so rare, I won't, I won't worry about it. Now, th there are two ways to, uh, to study this kind of thing. One of them is by actually looking at real elections, looking at large quantities of data. And the other, uh, the other is numerical simulation. And that, that you know, both of these are, have been done, are being done. Numerical simulation is maybe a little harder than you might think because you have to have a model of the, pre of the preferences in the population. And uh, it's, um, there, there are several competing models, but none of them is uniformly um, regarded as, as the best. And the model of preferences in the population uh, does affect the conclusions you get as to the frequency of these problems. So are you in the same horrible position where you can't actually say that any of these systems is in practice any better than any other? Because you can, because there are people who can say there are, one of the, another problem with sort of the, the voting nerds is that everybody chooses their favorite system and then they fight and nobody yeah. can say that the system is actually good in practice. Uh, a lot of people get very committed to, uh, to, to voting. You're quite right and so, uh, some of the, uh, systems that I described we were actually invented on the internet. That is, uh, they appeared first in somebody's blog. Um, so the, some people are very committed. The, uh, I think there are some fairly credible studies of, say, the propensity not to elect a Condorcet winner, which um, that, that, are, that are numerical or actually theoretical, that is, uh, they depend on a particular model of preferences in the population. So that, um, but I don't think there's any um, uh, uniform study which compares voting systems as to the, the frequency of violations of, of properties that you would like. 
And if, if you knew that, then of course you could put scores on the properties that you like and see which one, which system gave you the highest score. I, I think it's not, not at that stage yet. Well, I think what we can, we can say is that uh, theoretical properties have been computed uh, and they make these simplifying assumptions, but a number of political scientists have looked at real elections and tried to argue how often is a Condorcet winner not elected? Because theoretically, we can determine those numbers. Analytically, even, we don't even need computer simulation, although the study started out with computer simulation. Uh, but we find that in a number of important elections, um, there's manipulation of some cost sought, strategic voting, and uh, typically uh, one introduces a third alternative. In Congress, for example, uh, you uh, introduce an amendment to a bill. That creates a Condorcet paradox and is designed to split either, let's say, the Republican Party or the Democratic Party. Uh, when they split, the other party can go on and win. So not only do these um, paradoxes happen in theory, and we can make calculations of how often, um, there's a strategic incentive to create these paradoxes in order to win. So that's a new wrinkle which we didn't talk about. Uh, so even though these studies that say, in theory, this happens, uh, probably overestimate the probability they underestimate the strategic advantage people take to create these paradoxes. Thank you. Here. I'm actually more interested in multi-member elections, like for parliament or for city councils. I'm wondering what kind of work has been done, similar to what you've talked about tonight for single-member elections, what kind of similar work has been done for multi-member elections? You know, can, we, uh, can we propose criteria for multi-member elections, similar to the criteria that you've that have been proposed, uh, that you went over tonight, uh, if such criteria are produced, can we analyze them? Has anyone done so? Um, your comments, please. Why don't you go? Yeah. Well, what, one of my current um, projects involves multi-winner elections, so that's where you elect a committee, for example. Um, but that, I am not sure you may be referring to the, the uh, desire for proportional representation. And uh, that's, that's kind of another question that I think I would like to deflect to Steve, if that's, if that's what you would, if that's what you're asking. But yes, you can, you can answer, you could ask these questions. It hasn't been done very much. So proportional representation would be, I think, one example of a criteria similar to what you've mm -hmm suggested yes. for single person elections, yes. you know, uh, where a criteria is how well does the voting system reflect the, mm -hmm. the proportions of people who have voted. So, you know, what kinds of studies, have there been mathematical studies of that done of different ways of, of achieving that? And are there similar kinds of criteria um, for multi-member elections, yes. like there are a whole bunch of criteria mm -hmm. for, for the single elections. There are, there yes. are. And uh, most democracies do use proportional representation. So the usual system is that you vote for a political party, you don't vote for individual candidates, and the party gets numbers in proportion, numbers uh, elected to parliament, in proportion to the number of votes they get. So that automatically dictates proportional representation to the extent that it's possible with whole numbers rather than fractions. Um, but um, in the United States, and maybe in Canada, uh, there are kind of compromises made. So for example, a system called cumulative voting allows voters in electing, say, a city council, if there are five members of the council, to have five votes. And they can apportion them any way they want. So there's a 20% minority, and that minority puts five votes on one candidate, one minority candidate, there are studies that show that minority can elect that candidate. And those demonstrations have actually led to the <clears throat> use of cumulative voting, mostly in small cities in the United States. The way you try to get proportional representation uh, in most cities is um, <clears throat> through a kind of parliamentary system where the numbers to the city council are hopefully in proportion to the size, but with single member districts that doesn't work. 
especially if the minority is not concentrated in a particular area. So they lose the majority in all these different districts. So if the minority is scattered, cumulative voting allows them to pile up votes on one or two minority candidates and assure that. So that's kind of a way of dealing with multi-winner situations and getting proportional representations that, that's actually been used. Yeah, I, I think study is really just starting uh, on that kind of issue. Hello. Um, I have a question regarding sort of the party aspect of voting. Um, are there certain method, or it's not even party, forget that. Um, are there certain methods or uh, alternatives here that are considered uh, superior when candidates are in a smaller number, three or four, versus 10 or 12 or upwards of that or beyond? Um, and if you set aside the idea of voter complexity and how voters uh, are acting in the booth. So you're saying that if you have a large number of candidates, you should maybe have a different procedure than if you have a small number of candidates. Uh, are there are there well, considerations what, that are diff considered different or that make some systems seem superior in those systems? Um, up until now, not very much, though complexity issues are, are um, more and more occupying uh, the people who study these things. So if, if you have a large number of candidates, you know, it, it may be NP hard to decide how, you, how to fill out your ballot. And, uh, may, so it, um, that, that's one issue that uh, may mitigate against some, uh, some electoral systems. Um, but in terms of, you know, would there, is there a better procedure if you have three or four candidates as opposed to five or six candidates? Uh, I, I don't think there's any, any strong results that way that, that I know of. But in practice, uh, when there are, say, 20 candidates running, uh, it usually comes down to two or three of main contenders. And those become the viable candidates, and people will concentrate their attention on them. With something like approval voting, of course, you can still vote for those fringe candidates, but you damn well better vote for one of the viable candidates. So numbers don't so much matter. When a new candidate enters, uh, you can continue to do what you did and then make a judgment. Do you like or dislike the candidate? So I think approval voting is particularly invulnerable to numbers like that. If I could have a quick follow-up. Uh, Actually, um, given the lineups and the time, I, I'd like to ask everybody to limit themselves to one question and no follow-ups. Hi. Regarding Condorcet winner criteria for the approval voting, isn't it means that, say, if I vote, yeah, approved to two candidates, even though maybe I feel closer, I prefer one candidate more than the other, but for all intents and purposes, in approval voting, it means that I'm equally likely between these two candidates. It doesn't reflect that, oh, I prefer candidate A over candidate B, because I ended up voting yes for both of them, or voting yes, no for both of them. With approval voting, you guarantee the election of a Condorcet winner based on your approval votes. Now, if those approval votes don't, if they hide a ranking underneath, it's possible that you don't elect a Condorcet winner. But if you just use approval votes to determine whether approval voting elects a Condorcet winner, the answer is it always does. Steve and I have a slight disagreement on this, as I, <laughs> as I, I think that in approval voting, if you have, uh, you have utilities for the candidates to start up here and go down to there, then you have to decide what your cutoff is, which candidates you're going to vote for. So it's, it's, I think it's sort of a strategic decision. Um, it's true, if there's only a couple that you like and everybody else you don't care about, then it's obvious what you should do. But you're right, it, um, uh, what, one thing that might make you feel better about doing this is that if, the, uh, if you vote as you just described and you end up not getting a Condorcet winner, then that person is not the, con the difference between that person and the Condorcet winner is actually very small. So you haven't missed by much. Thank you. Hi, uh, so mathematically, a majority is represented by a set of people with gr greater than 50% of the size of a group. However, in Canada, uh, our first past the post system allows uh, bigger parties to obtain majority mandates with even 35% of the vote, often at the expense of other parties who can get as much as 10% of the popular vote but still not get any seats. 
what would be your elevator pitch to people who support these major parties uh, to suggest to them to adopt a fair voting system, even though it may come at the expense of a more accurate and thus smaller representation of their party of choice in Parliament? Well, <laughs> well you, uh, as a Canadian, you should answer I that should, question. I, should, yeah. <laughs> uh, I think that um, you know, somehow you get the system that you want. And the prob problem is that not enough people feel upset about the lack of representation of, of the, the small of the minority groups. Um, you know, there, there, are, there are proportional representation systems. Uh, the one that I like, you, you, would, you would have two votes, one for the party and one for your local member. But, uh, so it could be done. But um, it, it always, I, I ask someone in, in Norway somewhere, you know, why was it, you know, the government decided to change the voting system in Norway, because most countries don't do that. Well, he said, they knew they were going to lose. <laughs> <laughs> they wanted, suddenly they wanted proportional representation. So um, it's, it's very hard to get the people who make the decisions to be motivated to do what you, what you have suggested would be a good idea. Um, <clears throat> just a, first of all, a preface. I mean, you mentioned at the beginning when you said that there are, you know, um, two elements to a democracy, which is like the free and fair elections, but also the rule of law. And uh, I would like to suggest that there's a third uh, uh, crucial element, which is a healthy public role, where there's discussion and debate and opportunities for discussion and debate so people can develop the criteria mm -hmm. for deciding which they, uh, uh, um, uh, of wh who their best candidate is. And so some argue that that uh, would lean toward a more participatory democracy than mm -hmm. a representative democracy. So that would be a different debate than a mathematical debate. Okay. And the actual question I have is with regard to the uh, is approval, uh, uh, approval voting the same as the Roman ballot? Because I came from a college, university, that had a Roman ballot, where everybody in all faculty members were put, 60 faculty members, small college. And for important elections, everybody was nominated. And then there was a, a process of elimination. Everyone was nominated and everyone voted in the room. It sounds more like the hair system where you eliminate sequentially the lowest candidates. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so th that's not approval voting. Um, but the first part of your question, um, shouldn't there be more deliberation? Shouldn't that be considered? There's a whole, actually a literature in what we call deliberative democracy. And there were proposals such as, shouldn't the election be decided by, say, taking a random sample of people uh, and bringing them together for two days a week, having them to discuss the issues so they are thoroughly informed by each other, and then voting. Can't do this for everybody in the country, but you can do it for a small sample. So that's actually been discussed. And there are mathematical models for this and conditions under which uh, it would seem to work. But in my opinion, it really hasn't taken off the ground. Nobody wants to be disallowed from voting for the purposes of encouraging more deliberation. One would hope that a better voting system would encourage more deliberation. But I think in a large democracy, we're not in Greek times anymore. Yeah. You can, not everybody can participate. Yeah. Yeah. Can, can I add that I think a democracy requires a free press, that is you know, open discussion, and that's, I, that's probably another requirement for a yeah. democracy. Yeah. Hello, so my question concerns the uh, the Pareto principle that was mentioned in the first PowerPoint, um, more specifically the requirement that for it to be valid, um, every single person in who's voting has to vote for a certain candidate over another. So um, for it to be valid, every person has to have picked X over Y. Therefore, Y cannot win the race. Right. So um, I was wondering if, if that principle still holds, even if one person um, did not adhere to that standard. So can, can a voting system still be considered Pareto if there's one unique exception, or is it absolute? No, well, um, if, if the voting system that you're using is dictator, 
and the dictator happens to be the sole exception, yes. then, it will, then the system will fail Pareto. But say there's but, a... No, I, I agree that won't be very likely. I agree that's unreasonable. But the Pareto, the Pareto is an extremely strong condition. It says if, if everybody likes X better than Y, then Y can't win. Okay. And so that, that, that is, is a slightly weaker statement than what you said, if almost everybody likes X better than Y, then Y can't win. No, I, I mean, Pareto, the Pareto condition that I gave was very demanding. So what I described was not the Pareto condition, right? Yeah, yeah. What you're what you're doing is weakening it a bit. That's all. Okay. But yeah, I yeah. In a reasonable system, you would you would think that most of the time, if most people liked X better than Y, then Y wouldn't win. Okay. Thanks. Sure. Yeah. Uh, this is for Dr. Uh, Brams. You say the the advantage of approval voting is that it elects the strongest candidate overall, and then in brackets centrist, not extremist, mm -hmm. and then you say that it will induce new candidates, especially centrists, again, uh, to run. And uh, why, so my first question is, why is that good? And uh, the second part is that when you say uh, that this will, um, that one of the disadvantages is that it may undermine the two-party system, why on earth do people think that's bad? <laughs> Some people think it's bad. I don't think that uh, undermining the two-party system is bad at all. That was basically a rhetorical uh, question. Um, remind me of what you just said. I, uh, centrist, okay. Good question. I think if you're electing a single winner, uh, a centrist candidate uh, makes sense. If you're electing a legislature, you want all different factions to be represented. So I'm drawing a qualitative difference between electing a legislature or a parliament and electing a single winner. I think with a single winner, you want people to choose somebody who is as approved as possible. Uh, and that's what approval voting does. Uh, now, I understand your point of view if it's that shouldn't there be radical elements that express themselves. I think the radical elements on the left or right should express themselves in the legislature. But if we wanted to choose a common leader, a president, prime minister, um, I think centrists should be favored. We have time for one last question. Is there anybody wanting to see other questions? Um, and before I ask you to join me and thank our speakers, I'm just going to hold you captive a couple more minutes. I want to announce a few more uh, lectures that are coming up. And also, where are Stephen's books? <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, I'll, we got one here, so good. Just, just let me keep track of those. Anyways, just to announce the following public lectures. On Thursday, March 5th at the Waterloo Inn, and it's part of the uh, Catholic Experience Series lectures, Dr. Hazel Markwell and Dr. Donna Ward are giving the 13th Annual John Sweeney Lecture in Current Issues in Healthcare, and it's entitled Death with Dignity, Encountering Patients as Whole, patients as whole Persons. Again, I remind you that's at the Waterloo Inn. On Monday, March 9th, in the Earth Sciences Museum at the University of Waterloo, there are two public lectures organized by Benoit Charbonneau, who is the organizer of this series, and the Faculty of Mathematics. Um, Hubert Bray, professor, professor of Mathematics and Physics at Duke University, will first of all be presenting a talk from Pythagoras to Einstein, the geometry of space and time at 6 o'clock. And then for a public lecture for children, ages eight and up, and I would include myself in it, given my lack <laughs> of knowledge of this area, at 7.15, he's, he's speaking on the science behind Trevor the Time Traveler. And as a historian, maybe I could learn something. Um, finally, on Friday, March 13th, and there's never any bad luck on March 13th, because we're all scientists here, we don't believe in that. Uh, back here in Siegfried Hall for the last of this season's Bridges Lectures, we have a talk, Dancing the Math of Complex Systems, and our speakers are Sarah Tolmey from the English Department, who is back here, and uh, Don Cassandra Parker from the Waterloo Institute for Complexity Innovation and the Faculty of Environment, who's also here tonight. And those talks are going to be here in the Siegfried Lecture, or say the Siegfried Hall, on Friday, March 13th. So before we break for snacks and goodies, and, I w and I'd like to wish everybody a very safe drive home, please join me in thanking our two speakers for another great talk. <laughs> <laughs>